Ms. Reeder. Good morning, Your Honors. <clears throat> May it please the court, my name is Kim Reeder, and I represent the appellant Miria in this case. I'm admitted pro hoc vice here in Iowa, and I've been working closely throughout the course of this case with Chris Nuss and Bill Brown at Brown Winnick, and as you know, I'll be presenting this morning. The ultimate issue in this case is whether uh, Miria Holdings should be included in a consolidated Iowa return with its subsidiaries, with its Iowa subsidiaries. However, at a much more practical level, what we're looking at is where do we draw the line? Uh, this court drew a line six years ago in the KFC Corporation versus Department of Revenue case. Uh, the department came to this court and asked for a very broad jurisdictional standard for when a company would be subject to tax in Iowa, and this court gave it that standard. Um, under the KFC case, um, engaging in transactions such as uh, entering into contracts with unrelated third parties uh, who use intangibles in the state of Iowa will be sufficient to uh, cause that out-of-state taxpayer to be subject to tax in the state. Um, we're back today to look at how the Department of Revenue has applied KFC. And it is true that we have different intangibles at issue in this case. Um, we'll discuss whether or not that should matter. Uh, however, this case is also different in one other key respect. When KFC was um, included, was pulled into Iowa and taxed in Iowa, KFC was a profitable entity. And so when it was subject to tax in Iowa, uh, the tax burden increased, the tax revenues increased. What we have here with Miria is that Miria is um, not a profitable entity. And so when it is included in the consolidated report with its Iowa subsidiaries, then it's the income of that group, or the taxable revenue of that group, goes down. Um, and so that causes the overall tax revenue to, to go down. And by the way, there's an another case that this court sent to the Court of Appeals, the Romantics case, uh, where this is uh, similar facts. We have an entity that is not a profitable entity that um, is wishes to be included in a consolidated, Iowa consolidated report and is has been excluded by the department. Regardless of the type of intangible at issue or the impact on state tax revenue, uh, the standard, the jurisdictional standard for when a taxpayer is going to be taxable in Iowa should be the same as this court. It should be the standard that this court set forth in KFC. Counsel, let's let's focus on uh, the revenue that came, um, I'll describe it as upstream to the holdings company. Um, and, and I think I understand the, um, the way the tax allocation agreement was working. Mm -hmm. Would you talk a little bit about the other revenue that that came into holdings from the subsidiaries. What, what was the nature of that income and what was it based derived from other than just the mere fact that the holding company owned an interest in the, right. in, in the subs? Right. Um, so uh, as you know, there we um, described two types of intangible property that are at issue here, um, money and then also uh, shares of stock. And the um, the the income that was being derived from the Iowa subsidiaries um, other outside of the tax allocation agreement um, would be income that relates to the shares of stock intangible. Um, and so, yes, it would be um, dis distributions as it relates to the ownership interest, right? It would be, as we described in our brief, um, Miria had $1.3 billion in outstanding debt um, in the tax year at issue. It paid $200 million. And so its source of, of income to pay, um, to, to pay service on the debt was from these operating subsidiaries. So wh why is that income flow to holdings uh, not just a, a, an incident of ownership and control, which, mm -hmm. which is not enough right. to, sure. to make your taxable. Sure. Well, I think when we look at that, at the statute that the legislature created that specifically tells us that owning and controlling isn't sufficient, right? Um, 
you know, we can imagine a spectrum of holding companies and the types of activities that they have. And, and Myriad, it, it is a holding company. And so, um, you know, there may be some holding companies that merely acquire a subsidiary and they just hold that investment. Um, they take no action other than owning, maybe they set the board of directors, um, but, and that would be a type I believe, Miriam believes, that would be the type of holding company that would be uh, uh, implicated by the statute that the legislature created that discusses, discusses owning and controlling a subsidiary. But let me say, you know, wh why didn't you make this clear? I mean, why didn't you just have a management services agreement with the management fees going upward from the subsidiaries to Miriam? Why not do it that way? I mean, you have all these lawyers it's a very sophisticated operation. Right. Well, if we could go back in time, we would. Um, but the, or is that because yeah. that would be subject to franchise tax in Texas? Right. Well, it's the the reason that this was structured this way. So as it, as you know, the um, these are these are Miria is the majority shareholder. Is the eighty percent, hundred percent of one of the subs, and then the lower tier is an eighty percent owner. So, um, you know, I would say that if we had a um, if we had 100% ownership of everything, we wouldn't have to have any agreements at all. I mean, we, you know, from a, we, because we would wholly own these subsidiaries, we could control them in any way that we wanted to. The cash flows, how they came up, as long as we booked them correctly, as long as we followed all the rules we needed to do on that, it wouldn't matter. Um, the reason the tax allocation agreement gets pulled out specifically, the reason we have that is because for at the operating level, uh, there was a 20% um, other owner. And so it was necessary uh, because Myria, for federal income tax purposes, would include uh, these operating subsidiaries in its federal consolidated return and, and did. Um, it needed to have clarity with regard to that other 20% owner that on tax issues that uh, it would, there was, there was a specific agreement that it would get um, the uh, any funds that needed to be uh, addressed as far as tax concerns. So that's why we had this one agreement. I, I would say, you know, otherwise we we wouldn't have agreements, and we actually may be more in the situation that. For example, Romantics is in where there, you know, when you have these wholly owned entities and there isn't any back and forth as far as agreements between the subs. Um, so, so um, what are the other? Um, what I mean, maybe the record doesn't reflect this or it's confidential. But what are other states? Uh, I mean, there are these pipeline operations in Indiana and Illinois. What? What, what is going on, on there? How are those jurisdictions treating this situation? Yeah, so, well, <laughs> they're different. There are different jurisdictional issues. There are different sort of taxing systems in, in those states. Um, so for example, uh, Illinois has um, uh, a combined reporting statute. And so that's sort of, it's the, the issues of, of jurisdiction um, aren't, aren't, as, aren't as critical. Um, so, so that I, that's how what I would say about that. Um, so, the as I mentioned, there are two types of intangibles that are at issue here. We have we have shares of stock and we have money, and those are both intangibles that are listed in the department's regulation um, as types of intangibles that can acquire a situs here in Iowa. Um, on the shares of stock, as we've already talked about, we uh, own the stock um, up to, um, their LLC interests actually, but uh, they are, because at the, at the lower levels they were consistently treated as shares of stock, that's, that's how we've presented it to this court. Um, and so, as we noted earlier, the, uh, the, there is a, a statute, the legislature has created an exemption that says where we have share, where we have a parent that merely owns and controls a subsidiary, that um, parent will not be subject to tax in the state. As I said, we would um, argue that we did much more than own and control. Um, merely by virtue of the organization of these entities as LLCs, uh, LLCs are, as you know, are, are different from corporations. Um, LLCs require 
uh, by statute, there, there's more involvement of management. It's not just run by a board of directors. Uh, we were also involved in other ways. We were involved in the day-to-day -day operating activities. We were setting strategic priorities. We were assisting with treasury, accounting, and legal. And then, as we've also discussed, uh, we were also participating in this tax allocation agreement. And, and the tax allocation agreement as it relates to the shares of stock, uh, what that just shows is additional activity. It shows additional activity. Um, now, it, it also shows, we believe, and this has been a point of contention in this case, we also believe that it shows that um, the subsidiaries were able to use uh, Myriad Holdings cash for, for periods of time, uh, almost like a, a revolving cash line to some extent. So to the extent that we, we Mary could have taken distributions from these subsidiaries at, at any time. Uh, however, uh, it, for, for ease, uh, similar to the way uh, we may not pay all of our own personal transactions in cash, we may use a credit card and settle that at the end of the month. Um, these transactions were settled quarterly. And so as they were settled, they were settled quarterly um, for that period of time when the cash was not taken from these uh, subsidiaries, there was an account payable um, that was growing on the books of the subsidiaries, and there was an account receivable growing at the Myriad Holdings level. So in that way, um, and, and these are, you know, these are, are large sums, and so in that way, um, we allow these subsidiaries to have use of this working capital uh, for time that they wouldn't have normally had these funds. And in doing that, uh, you know, those would be, uh, you know, those funded the operations here. Those paid for compliance, safety compliance costs for the pipeline or salaries for um, Iowa employees. And so, and so that is as it relates to the shares of stock. Uh, we also have another intangible, which is money. And the money relates specifically to the tax um, allocation agreement and really goes to the process that I just described. And in order for the money, we don't have legislative guidance, we don't have another statute that tells, gives us a, a safe harbor there. So we're, we're left applying the test of whether it is integral to um, business activities in Iowa. And as I just described, we have this situation where the, um, where the cash is being used at the subsidiary level for a longer period of time the working, as working capital uh, than, it, it, than Miri had to let it be used there. It could have taken that cash at, at any time, and it didn't. Um, and so in that way, um, the, it's, this cash does become um, localized, that's the, that's the word that was used in the KFC decision, um, the intangible becomes localized because, this, because the cash, the money, which is the intangible, is used in connection specifically with something that occurs in Iowa. Council, as I understand uh, the record, uh, Holdings doesn't have employees, right? No, no. So if they didn't have employees, how were they engaging in the operating activities right. of the subs, well, it, whether, whether in the form of accounting services right. or legal or the rest? So the, the way this, um, these entities are structured, um, there are um, Im investment firms uh, above it that own Myria Holdings, um, and um, my client, Jason Francel, who's here with me today, um, he, for example, is an employee of that Steel River entity uh, that owns Myria Holdings and owns other holding companies. And the way they structure that business is that uh, there's a, um, an, a services agreement, right, between this upper tier entity and Myria Holdings. So although he's not technically an employee of Myria Holdings. He dedicates, I think he said in the record, something like 20% of his time at times um, to this Myria entity. And so, um, and, and really whether Myria chooses to have its own employees or enter into a management services agreement to have employees from another entity, it, it's still being, you know, it's services being paid for by the Myria Holdings entity. So it is, I mean, those activities are being performed at that, at that level. Who, who's, uh, who's Kinder Morgan? And oh. who, Kinder Morgan's the other 20% mm -hmm. owner of this and, and 
who is, we haven't heard much about that, but who is the, the other 20% that has to, you know, they're 20% owners of this pipeline and natural gas pipeline and all the others. How, how, do, the, how do they enter into this? And uh, are they subject to the same tax scheme as you are then? Are they not part of your consolidated tax return? Or, no, or how, no, they. What's the interaction there? How do, do they provide any type of management or legal or other uh, services here, or are they simply a 20% holder out there that doesn't do anything? Um, well, so Kinder Morgan, because it's a 20% owner, um, it only, um, uh, it, it, it doesn't run into the same sorts of consolidated reporting issues that you do. 80% is kind of the magic number for, um, for having to worry about these consolidated, for federal purposes, for these consolidated return issues. So, um, so that's what, um, th that's that's why Kinder Morgan isn't implicated in that way. That's why they're not involved in this particular That's thing right. from your standpoint. Right. But I'm just looking at it from the overall standpoint of taxation. And then I guess what you allocate money to them, you, how, I don't right, right. understand they, the they Right, they, they, receive, they receive distributions as well. Um, I mean, just clearly in, a, in smaller amounts. Um, but but uh, Miria and, and Steel River ultimately were, were really the, the driving force as far as managing this, um, as far as managing this, this entity. Okay, okay. My, my time uh, is, is going up. So I don't know what that means. You, you may sum up your argument. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for explaining. Um, so um, as, as, I'm, as we discussed, uh, we have two intangibles uh, here in Iowa. We have shares of stock. We have money. Um, as set forth in our briefs, we believe we derive income from those intangibles, and as such, under the KFC standard, uh, should be subject to tax in Iowa and included in the combined report. Thank you. Ms. Reeder, thank you as well. Mr. Stanley. Thank you, Chief Justice. May it please the court. Um, wanted to start uh, where uh, Ms. Reeder did and say that um, drawing the line, and she talked about the KFC case, and as, as I think uh, people are aware the KFC was a constitutional case for the most part. 22 of the, uh, it was 22 page case. There were three paragraphs about the state law part. The rest was constitutional. And I think that uh, a point the department wanted to make right off is whether or not the state would be able to constitutionally uh, apply the income tax in this case is really not the issue. The issue is state law. And the, the government does not have to extend uh, the income tax to the uh, furthest extent they can constitutionally. In fact, many states don't even have a corporate income tax. But in Iowa, what this case is really about is that under 422.33, uh, uh, you have to pay uh, income tax if you have uh, business here or you derive income from here. And in 422.37, uh, they have a list of safe harbors. Mary has called them a narrow safe harbor. There are actually eight categories that I think reasonably you could think would affect thousands and thousands of businesses. Uh, but they have a list of things that don't uh, qualify uh, for the uh, safe harbor in 42234A. Uh, and so in 42237, it says if you're subject to tax under uh, 42233, you have to be included in the return. But 42234A says all these activities, including owning and controlling the in, in interest in the uh, subsidiary corporations, don't qualify. And I think that's really uh, the importance here. They've said that the department is abandoning rules and examples, and certainly we're not happy to talk about any of those, and we do in our brief, but the reason we say we're not relying on the rules and examples is this is a statutory question. You don't even get into the rules and examples because they don't meet the statutory requirements. So, so is it your position that um, 
owning, so you have owning and controlling a subsidiary, that's, that's a, a safe harbor. And then the second one is borrowing money. So to the extent they're borrowing from their subsidiary through this tax allocation agreement uh, by letting the subsidiary keep the money until it's needed. So that's your argument, essentially. No, not exactly. We there is no borrowing in this in this case at all. That's just factually incorrect. Well, they say they are. They say right. that they could collect that money earlier, and they're letting the subsidiary keep it for the operations. Is that wrong? Yes, they could control their subsidiary by having the subsidiary give them money for anything. But the tax allocation agreement, and they say we're putting form above substance, is actually all the same thing. It is in form a tax allocation agreement. And in substance, what happens is the subsidiaries pay to them 30 days before the tax is due. Uh, and so what they've really done is taken the money uh, 30 days early, which means they're actually taking money away from the subsidiaries that they could be using in their operation for that extra time. They're taking money away from the subsidiaries early, they're not letting them. Okay, but use that's them. not a safe harbor. No, that there's two uh, items here. One is doing business in the state, and there's a safe harbor that says they're not doing business in the state because they're owning and controlling the business. The second one is driving income, and that's where the tax allocation agreement comes in. It comes into the second. Uh, part of the statute and the reason they're not deriving income is they're just it's just a pass-through Entity where they're getting money from the subsidiaries and turning it over to the government It's not income to them. They testified that they that it's just to pay the taxes They testified it wasn't gross income. They've never reported it as income. It's a pass-through with they, respect to with respect to the um, the income distributions that are being sent, uh, passed on to Myria Holdings. Um, the argument is that, well, we could, we could demand that those distributions be made more, uh, more promptly. We let them hold the funds and only make them pay them quarterly. And so we're allowing, we're, we're in effect giving them working capital and that's, uh, that's, distinguishable from mere ownership and control is what's your reaction to that uh, we we put the definition of control in in our response brief and in the definition of control from the dictionary it has in there both the things that they're talking about it has uh, managing and it has directing and so what they say is we're not merely ownership and control merely is applied a lot in legal context. It's not applied a lot to broad words like ownership and control. Control is pretty broad, and it, mean, and it means directing. But what the transcript says, as we also put in the brief, is they say we control the subsidiaries and we sort of set priorities. As you mentioned, Justice Heck, they don't uh, have any employees. The board meets quarterly regularly, sometimes more often than that. Um, but in terms of the day-to-day -day operation, there's no evidence in the record that they control anything beyond control in terms of, that's a pretty broad term, and there's nothing in the record that says uh, they do more than that because it includes management, it includes directing the subsidiaries. And so we don't think it goes past that. So those distributions, which are the same as any parent company would have uh, from subsidiaries, aren't included. They're exempted under uh, 422.34a. I also want to uh, point out, they said the difference in this case was that they owed money. Uh, but in the record, it says they owed uh, or they, they would get a refund. In the record, it says that for 2009, which is what this case is about, it says in 2010, they also had losses. We would give them a refund. But the department allowed them to participate in the consolidated return because in 2010, 
uh, Maria Holdings had income from rental property. So the difference by the department wasn't that one year they got losses, one year they didn't. It was that one year they did something that qualified them to be on the consolidated return, the other year it didn't. Uh, they've said that they're concerned about the public fisc and this being a narrow public policy uh, position. Uh, we have to enforce the laws. The legislature put down this list of safe harbors. If they want to lobby the legislature and say, I know we're asking for almost four million back, but overall you'd get more money if you took this out of the safe harbor, the remedy for them is at the legislature. The department has to follow the law, whether this would be more income or not, and the court follows what the statute says. This is a state law question, and we're just asking uh, to follow that. In terms of this tax allocation agreement, they have a, an analogy in the 39-page uh, reply brief that says this is the difference between paying a kid allowance and paying the neighbor boy $5 to mow the yard and the income is here. That, that's one, uh, the, to be accurate, the, the, the child would have to be paying the parent allowance, which is a little different, but the real analogy here, I was thinking about when I was a kid in the Des Moines schools, my parents often would give me a dollar five to take to the school and that meant uh, my two little sisters who were in the same school as me, we could each get uh, a public school lunch. There were only 35 cents then. Uh, but even as a sixth grader, I knew that money wasn't my money. It wasn't income to me. It was money my parents were paying the school so we could get a hot lunch, and I was just the conduit. And in this case, it's the same thing. They're the conduit for the tax money to the state and federal uh, authorities from the subsidiaries who are paying it over to them, they're paying it over. They say in the transcript that this it, tax allocation agreement's not a contract. Also, Iowa's not even involved because a correct filing doesn't include Maria Holdings here, and what they need to do under Iowa law is designate one of the subs as the one that that uh, pays this. So this contract doesn't apply. It's a tax allocation agreement in form. It's a tax allocation agreement in substance. It doesn't create any income for Myria Holdings. They're not paying anything back to Myria Holdings because Myria Holdings uh, is just passing it on to pay the taxes. And the case law is clear and they haven't uh, ever offered anything else that says a tax isn't a debt. So these subsidiaries aren't paying back a debt to Muriel Holdings for the taxes because taxes aren't considered a debt under the law. They're just paying the taxes 30 days before they're paid here. I do want to make a couple of comments about the reply brief. Like I said, it was long. We had in the initial brief, they had a section that ambiguity should be uh, in their favor because they're the taxpayer and they quote about six uh, state and federal cases. We pointed out in the response brief that in those cases, uh, the, they had cut off part of the, uh, part of the uh, site and it showed that actually uh, it was construed in favor of the taxpayer so that, they, I, I apologize, so that they would avoid uh, having to pay a tax. It, it, what it really says is that you have to intend clearly for the tax to apply. So in the reply brief, they didn't bring those cases up again. They had three new cases, American Home Products and a General Electric case and uh, Nauman versus the PAB board. And in those first two American Products and General Electric, within a paragraph of their site, it says exactly that again. It says the tax has to be clearly intended to apply. The other thing that was interesting, all of those are in a footnote and have parentheticals that say without consideration as to whether uh, it's you know, an increase in taxes uh, or not. That phrase, which is put between two quoted phrases, doesn't appear in any of these three cases. I know the justices and the clerks will, will see that when you uh, look at the, uh, the briefs, but those, those don't uh, apply. 
Even more troublesome for them, though, uh, Justice Heck, is the Nauman uh, decision that you authored. In that case, uh, there was a property holder, a farmer in Madison and Adair County, and he was trying to fit under a section of 441 that said you can't have uh, in assessments on adjoining property more than a 5% uh, variance. And under uh, 21.1D in 441, it says that. Uh, but this court found that that didn't apply because agricultural property is covered under uh, section E in not section D and uh, section G says that. And so that's kind of analogous to this case. They want to be under 422.33 and uh, subject to the tax and subject to the consolidated return in 422.37. But they're really not. Their activities fall under 422.34a, which is that list of, of safe harbor. So just as in the Nauman case, uh, a, a taxpayer trying to get under one statute which would reduce their tax obligations when really their activities put them under a different uh, statute. I'd also like to say in there there's uh, citations to Jim McNulty, a uh, 32 year employee at the Department of Revenue who talked about the rules. In the district court brief, they uh, made uh, statements about Mr. McNulty's uh, testimony. And we replied in our brief and said, you know, this is out of context, you need more of the citation, all that. So in the first brief here for the Supreme Court, uh, they just said uh, various excerpts of his testimony and we made a, uh, an argument in our response brief that was a violation of uh, Appellate Rule 6907, they didn't tell us where these came from. So in, the, in, in their reply brief, they just listed some citations. And uh, that's not the way you know, we do uh, business here. That's not the way these uh, uh, citations should go. So with that, uh, thank you, Your Honors. Mr. Stanley, thank you as well. Rebuttal argument? I, I guess as an initial matter, um, I, uh, apologies for any uh, anything in that w our sites that were incorrect. We we corrected anything that we thought we hadn't provided enough information on in the reply brief and tried to give that information um, to the court. Um, just starting with the the KFC standard, uh, the the way uh, Justice Apple wrote that decision, um, what it says is we're trying to figure out in deciding this case, what the U.S. Supreme Court would decide. Now, if that case had gone before the U.S. Supreme Court, what it would have been deciding clearly was the constitutional issue. Um, and then later on, the, there's the reference to the um, to the, the way in which the, the regs are just an extension of evolving case law. I think, the, the, I'm paraphrasing, but that's the language that's used. And so it, it seems from that characterization that what this court did in KFC was to interpret the statute to the extent of the Constitution, that the... the, the, the it might be true, but isn't that case kind of a different situation? I mean, KFC was actually... There was an arm's length transaction between KFC and the franchisees, and KFC is making available certain intangible properties right. like the picture of Colonel Sanders and all that in return for money. Right. Whereas here, it does seem, notwithstanding your efforts, and, and I applaud their persistence, but it does seem like what we have here is kind of just a normal parent subsidiary relationship, right? Well, so I would actually argue that the, um, the, the KFC, um, by having unrelated parties, right, that that, was, that, that is more 
that's very broad. Um, it's typically all of the other cases that involved uh, trademarks that were that were cited in that decision. Um, those were related parties. So we typically think there can be kind of more shenanigans, right, when there are related parties involved. There's usually, because there, there's just for the reasons I described earlier, for wholly owned entities, uh, we have more ability for the parent to control what the subsidiary does. So there's unrelated parties. We expect those, as you said, those are arm's length. We expect those. Um, under federal principles, we look to Section 482. That's how we establish uh, related parties try to establish unrelated party status. And so by pulling in an unrelated party, um, that actually makes the standard very, very broad under KFC and presumably would, would take into account um, re related party transactions. We do have um, the, the statute that the safe harbor. Now, it, it, this, first of all, the safe harbor is not just for doing, for doing business in the state. It is um, also, it's doing business in the state or deriving income from sources within the state. So it does implicate the, the test that we're talking about here. And, and, and in this case, um, we, we look at the, uh, as far as the extent of control and what kind of effort we're looking for, um, we, we can look at the company that that owning and controlling provision is keeping. Um, it's talking about having uh, holiday parties. It's talking about maintaining a bank account. It's talking about use of the courts in Iowa. Those are the sorts of things that don't create a taxable presence. Those are, those are small, those are rather minimal amounts of activity. So we would expect that owning and controlling, what's meant by that, it's, it's minimal activities. And so activities such as um, the day-to-day -day, um, operational advice, the setting the strategic objectives, that is more than a company would do just by, say, electing a board of directors. Um, that's just that's just more um, effort. Um, also, I would say just the, the on the, there's been a lot of confusion around this issue of whether or not we actually had income, and and the idea is that um, when the department measures that, um, it, it's looking at it on a consolidated basis. So when we put all of the companies together, um, we don't count the transactions between them. Now, for purposes of determining whether we can even file a consolidated report, we shouldn't look at those companies on a consolidated basis. We need to look at them on a separate basis. And when we look at them on a separate basis, there would be income. There, there, would, be, there would be income here. And, and as I said, and because we uh, exceed the safe harbor on the shares of income at the very least, um, we uh, feel that we do um, have a, intangibles with a situs. Uh, on the money issue, we do feel that we have intangibles with a situs here in Iowa, um, satisfying that standard, and also that we do derive income. And I'm out of time, so thank you very much. Ms. Reeder, thank you again, and Mr. Stanley, uh, thank you as well. The case of uh, Miria Holdings is now submitted to the court, and the bailiff may adjourn. Hear ye, hear ye. The Honorable Supreme Court of the State of Iowa is now adjourned.